even if there are changes that have taken place in someone's body as a product of age, as a product of injury, there are still ways to enhance an experience, to make something more meaningful, to make something more value congruent. So even if there are changes that have taken place, I don't think it's ever too late to improve something as long as there's commitment to the process. We are back with another episode of the Erectile Dysfunction Radio Podcast. Today we are joined by Dr. Shai Krug. Dr. Krug is a psychologist and a certified sex therapist running a group practice called Blue Anchor Psychology, which has offices in Manhattan and in North New Jersey. Dr. Krug and I had the honor of doing some sex therapy training a few years ago, and I know that he is an empathic, intelligent, and thoughtful therapist. The way he thinks about sexual issues, I think, will be very important for our listeners to hear. Now, Shai, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's great to, uh, great to see you again. Yes, great to see you too. So today, what we want to get into and explore is what are men supposed to do when nothing seems to be getting better with a sexual dysfunction? Now, as you and I are both aware, sexual function challenges are extremely common. Many people are able to work toward some satisfactory solution, either physical or psychological, or oftentimes a combination of both. Some people, however, just are not able to make satisfactory headway towards their goals, and this can be really, really distressing. So, uh, Dr. Krug, just to get us started, why is it that some individuals may find it really challenging to find an effective treatment? Sure. So, uh, as is the case with many different mental health issues as well as, as medical issues, uh, there's oftentimes multifactorial etiologies that go into sexual health. So what that basically just means is that there are many different factors that can lead towards sexual health concerns. There could be medical factors, physiological factors, hormonal factors, psychological factors, cultural, religious, familial. There's so many different systems that contribute to healthy sexual function. And because of that, any dysregulation in any of those systems can manifest in some uh, dysfunction, some challenges in terms of sexual health and sexual function. So because there's so many different variables that can contribute to this, and there are therefore many different factors that need to be accounted for in treating sexual health concerns. Okay, so Dr. Krug, in your in your experience doing this work, and you know, for our listeners just to be aware, Dr. Krug also works with a lot of people in general with sexual function challenges, but in particular with men who are experiencing conditions like ED and uh, premature ejaculation, other ejaculatory disorders. In your experience, what are some of the most common emotions? that men experience when they are not making the kind of headway or progress towards improved sexual function? I think there's a pretty wide continuum of different emotional responses. There could be emotions related to, to the category of sadness, feeling down, feeling disappointed, feeling low self-esteem, feeling worthless. There could be emotions more of the category of anger, you know, feeling frustration, feeling anger, feeling irritation, irritability. Uh, there can be reactions related to avoidance, people withdrawing from their relationships or withdrawing from their own sexual experiences. Uh, there really be the whole continuum of different emotions associated with the lack of progress towards the, let's say, the optimal, uh, the goal of sexual health or sexual function that a man wants to work towards. Uh, but there's really no normal or abnormal emotional response. It's really a pretty diverse potential, uh, potential emotional reactions. Yeah. Do you find anything unique in the way that some of these men do respond to that inability to progress? I mean, in my experience, the devastation that some of these people experience is rather intense. I don't know if you have had a similar experience, but do you find anything unique? Sure. So I think that one of the common responses, certainly when there's uh, either a significant uh, if significant lack of progress, or if there's a, let's say, more acute onset that is, uh, does not have, a, let's say, a great prognosis, is there's oftentimes a sense of grief. There's a sense of loss of, of a, an important part of someone's life, almost as if someone might grieve if they, you know, lost a loved one. There's the experience of losing an important part of the, uh, of the individual or partnered experience. And that is really, in many ways, the source of grief, the source of grieving for the individuals. Dr. Krug, Oftentimes, when men come to see myself, I'm sure you've had this experience as well, is when they have tried already a number of things that have not been successful at helping them reach their goals. Now, within the therapy process, I find that I, as a clinician, I'm continuously learning 
from the people that I work with. I learn you know new things that I haven't understood before properly, and I find it to be this continuous learning process. In your experience, when men are failing like to achieve their goals and the therapy is not progressing, what are some of the primary reasons that that might happen? Sure. So as I mentioned before, because uh, sexual health functioning is, is, ma- is multifactorial, we always always want to evaluate, are we really treating the underlying cause? So now what, what sometimes might look like, let's say, an anxiety-related issue really might actually be something else that's driving the individual's experience. So we want to make sure we're, we're treating the right underlying issue. So sometimes as, over the course of the treatment progress, we take a little bit of it, or t- treatment process rather, we take a little bit of a step back to evaluate, are we, are we addressing the right underlying issue here? Um, so I think that's that's certainly one important consideration. I think another important consideration is, is it the artist, not the song? I think that many people think about, well, I need a specific kind of therapy. I need EMDR. I need CBT. I need psychoanalysis. I need you know prolonged exposure. I need exposure and response prevention. This is the specific intervention that I need. And what the most salient predictors of the effectiveness of therapy has actually been found to be is the relationship between the therapist and the patient. So what sometimes is focused on the specific intervention that's being used, what sometimes is actually happening is there isn't a sufficient rapport between the therapist and the patient, which is why there isn't progress being made. So sometimes uh, things can really be broken down to the patient doesn't feel safe enough to be vulnerable or the patient is not compliant with the tr- with the therapist's recommendations because the, the patient doesn't really believe the therapist or believe that in the therapist, the therapist's confidence in, in his self or herself. So... I think the the nature of the relationship between the therapist and the patient can be really as important as any of the specific modalities that are that are being used. Yeah, this is such an important point that you know, beyond the techniques and the approach, because that's a common question that I get asked: well, What do you do? How do you do it? But the therapeutic relationship uh, is so key to the process because if you don't trust you know, the person who you're working with, you don't feel comfortable to open up to them. That is really going to be a huge hindrance in the process for many, many people. Um, I think it's a really important and overlooked component to the entire therapy process. Now, when I hit a snag, a lot of times I'm back to the books. I'm, you know, trying to research like how can I be helpful to this person. You know, sometimes it's looking at the therapeutic relationship, but other times it's having to kind of dig into like learning new, new uh, tools, new approaches, new ways to think about things. In your experience, how often are you going back to the tool bag or the toolbox to to you know try something new or to you know try to help somebody find a new path or a new way? Sure. So I think this is what you opened up with today, which I think is the the truest thing about this line of work is you are never done developing as a clinician. There's always something new to learn, and because no two people are exactly the same, even if I saw a previous patient with the same exact same quote unquote exact presentation. It's not really the exact presentation because this is unique to this individual. So it's, I think the mindset of I'm continuing to try to learn, try to evolve, continue to develop, I think is really quite important. I actually, uh, maybe four days ago, had a supervision session with my my former uh, uh, ASEC certifying supervisor because I had a case that I thought was quite challenging and I wanted a second set of eyes to get kind of get some guidance of, am I thinking about this the right way? But to your point, Mark, I, I also go back to reviewing my previous textbook, my previous notes. To look at, is there something here that I'm not really seeing, something that I'm not getting? Um, I also regularly have uh, have regular peer supervision groups where we have a chance to talk about case and just get a second, just to bounce around some ideas. Am I am I missing the picture here? Because sometimes when you're so close to the to the experience, you don't see the whole picture. You know, I'm sure you've heard the phrase. You, sometimes you you miss the forest for the trees. Uh, sometimes you don't see what's going on right in front of your face because you're so close to the situation. But hearing someone a little bit more removed gives you a chance to gain some additional perspective. So I think uh, the idea of maintaining a growth mindset, I think maintaining a sense of humility in the process that even though um, you know I, I have training and background, the real expert in the room is the person that I'm talking to and making sure that I maintain the mindset of I'm here really to learn from your experience and to help you navigate what, you're, what, you're be, what you've been experiencing, but really through a lens of I'm really here in partnership with you, not as the expert who's going to tell you what to do to fix the, fix the problem that you're dealing with. Yeah, and that, that is, again, such, a, such an important point that I really want our listeners to understand is that, number one, your therapist, no matter how you know trained and how much expertise they have, 
it's only one set of eyes and they do oftentimes need to, you know, consult or have you know, peer supervision um, to get another pair of eyes to keep them, you know, objective or keep them like being able to see things from a much more, uh, a much broader perspective. And I think Dr. Dr. Krug is going to lead us into like the next area that I want to talk about bringing this back around to the client or to the patient focus, which is, you know, for many people when they're experiencing like, like kind of feeling stalled in the therapy process, they will drop out. They'll just, you know, send an email or leave a voicemail, send a text message that it's been very good, but they are going to be taking a break. And oftentimes they will not return to therapy. Can you speak to the importance of a client or a patient maintaining a more open communicative dialogue about how their process is going, especially in light of the complexity of therapy and the therapeutic relationship? Absolutely. So a loaded question. I think a lot of different directions we can go in with that question. I think first and foremost, I can absolutely empathize with someone who has gone through X number of months or even years of therapy and not seeing the progress they want to make. And then them feeling so frustrated by the process, wanting to say, you know what, forget this. I'm out. I'm out. I can absolutely empathize with just the sense of hopelessness or helplessness that someone might feel in that situation. So that's just first and foremost. And I, I, I get it. I can understand why that's so frustrating or so, or so disappointing or so overwhelming. I also think that sometimes the reaction that someone might have in that situation may actually serve as somewhat of a paradigm for how they're reacting in other aspects of their life. So if someone, when presented with a highly frustrating, highly disappointing situation, is finding themselves wanting to escape or avoid that situation, is that to some degree perhaps it's even happening in the relationship itself or in, in, uh, in specific sexual encounters that someone has, that their body is literally is physically retreating from the situation because of some sort of discomfort in the room. So I think that there's a lot of value in, in the, the term I like to use is avoid avoiding, which I think is actually a DBT concept, but to avoid avoiding that let's have a conversation about this because we can even in the process of talking about the frustration, actually tap into other components that might be impacting the progress in the therapy. So I think it's, it's really valuable to maintain that open dialogue. But I think the, the last point is in order for us to meaningfully modify our treatment plan to ensure that you are getting the care that you need and you are making the progress that you want to make. And this is a particular domain where there's you know, oftentimes a very specific outcome, a very specific target that someone is trying to move towards as a goal for therapy, that if things are not progressing in the way that you might like it to, we may have to cater our treatment plan and modify what we're doing to ensure that we're really moving towards toward whatever the treatment goals that you may have. And the only way we can meaningfully do that is if we have open communication about what's happening in the therapeutic process. Once again, Dr. Brigham, it's such important points about like the feedback from the patient or the client and this kind of being a process that is co-developed and needing to like know how how is this going? Is this working? What is working for you? What isn't working for you? What's working for you in the relationship with the therapist? These are all such crucial points. And you say that sometimes that that impulse to drop out like is more indicative of maybe a broader like issue that might be showing up in somebody's relationship where they would rather avoid than, you know, deal with a problem head on. And even being able to like really kind of find that courage to speak with your therapist about what isn't going well for you could be really impactful. Absolutely. Okay. Now to that end, kind of shifting over towards somebody's relationship when when you know a guy is feeling frustration about uh their erectile dysfunction about the therapy process and things are not uh going as they would like what role if any would a person's partner have in you know either being supportive or helping them work toward a more satisfactory solution or to accept um you know what what is going on for them now, are you talking about what's going on for them in the context of the therapy or what's going on for them in terms of their sexual function? I mean, what's going on for, in the context of their sexual function. Got it. So I think, first of all, the one of the little, little catchphrase I like to repeat to individuals and couples all the time is that when we talk about sexual health, it's never a me issue. It's always a we issue. And even in the even if someone is single, they're not even in a, in a partner in a relationship. Uh, a sexual relationship is oftentimes existing between two individuals or potentially more if it's a polyamorous relationship. 
So if there is a sexual concern, the idea that it's one person's job to fix on their own, I think is a little bit of a misconception and actually places undue pressure on the individual and on the sexual encounters that it's really one person's responsibility to make sure that this works properly. So I think in, in, as a general rule of thumb, I like to characterize the process in a uh, in addressing a, a sexual concern really as a we issue that we're addressing. And even if you are doing individual sessions with someone to work on, if it's, let's say, there's underlying anxiety or trauma that you're trying to process, I will always, in, in, in I would say virtually all cases, have some conjoint sessions along the way, either to do conjoint work or just for the partner to understand what is this individual going through and so that they can be a support in that journey through that, uh, in navigating that process. So I think as a general rule of thumb, I think it's it's incredibly important that the partner, even if they don't have a primary sexual concern, to be a source of support and a source of nurturance and, and critically, a source of acceptance and openness to the other individual's experience. Only through, uh, let's say, feeling safe and comfortable in a relationship can you allow yourself to be vulnerable. And when you're talking about sexual health and sexual function, opening up to that vulnerability is essential. So Dr. Krug, what advice or words would you offer somebody who has been struggling and is sincere in trying to, you know, resolve their underlying dysfunction, but they just can't seem to make the kind of progress that they want. And they have, you know, tried both physical interventions and therapeutic interventions, but just not getting the kind of movement. What what would you say to them? Well, first of all, I think I would just empathize with the source of pain that they may be feeling. And I think just trying to understand like what is the the significance or the meaning of what their physical functioning is, what their the the value they place in their sexual relationship, the value they place in their in their emotional relationship. Just trying to really understand what is the impact that this is having on this individual and couple's functioning. And I think first and foremost, I think just validating and empathizing with the source of pain. At the end of the day, I and no other therapist, no other physician are magicians, right? We can't let's say, wave a wand and, and all of a sudden things go back to the way that they were before. And in some cases, due to just the, the developmental course over, the, over the, the lifespan of an individual and changes in physical functioning, or if there are, let's say, concurrent medical issues, sometimes sexual function does change. And sometimes it doesn't go back exactly the way it was before. Um, you know, the, the way that a 25-year-old man experiences an erection is almost 100% going to be different than how a 75 or 85 year old man experiences an erection, just as a, as a product of age. But when you throw in medical issues, you know, diabetes, kidney disease, liver disease, certain cancers, uh, heart conditions, vascular health conditions, there are so many different physiological and meta components that go into sexual function. Sometimes a part of this process is kind of the opening up to the, some of the changes that have taken place, but continuing to explore ways to make sex meaningful and to make physical interactions value congruent. So if an individual is is targeting certain goals in therapy that they're not achieving, one thing we may explore in addition to just the validation and the empathy of the individual's experience is, are these goals that are workable? Are these goals that you're trying to achieve that are things that you can work towards and are there other ways we can enhance the sexual experience without placing this undue pressure on erectile functioning itself? And I think what, what ends up happening for many individuals is that there's a conflation, there's a, a, a joining of the experience of, let's say, intercourse and the experience of sex, whereas intercourse is a very specific physiological, biological act, while sex is really a, it's a language, it's a form of communication between two people's bodies uh, touching and communicating? And are there ways to make that experience meaningful, even if erectile functioning is not as predictable or as consistent as it might have been before? I think a part of this is examining what are the goals and how do we find workable ways to move towards the broader vision of what sex means to you, what the values are that are important to you, even if there have been some changes that don't seem to be res particularly responsive to intervention. Okay, hey, so in other words, like an erection is oftentimes a conduit toward you know, a broader, toward tapping into a broader sexual expression. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times the goals that, you know, people are looking to work toward big picture, like an enhanced sexual encounter that is not dependent on an erection. And sometimes if a man is at a 
a physical state or sometimes even in a mental state where achieving an erection consistently is no longer a realistic goal. There are ways that you can support a man towards expanding like whatever his preconceived definition was of sexual activity uh, to be more broad and ultimately to be a much more uh, meaningful and connecting experience for him and his partner. Absolutely. What I would add to that, though, is we want to make sure that we're not throwing in the towel unnecessarily. So if, let's say, an individual has not had a comprehensive medical workup, and we're saying, all right, I guess therapy doesn't work, but in reality, you're treating a medical issue through psychotherapy, well, we want to make sure that we're treating the right thing here. So if there are concurrent medical issues, let's get let's make sure we're doing a good comprehensive physical evaluation. Those are not things that we as mental health providers do, right? We will outsource that stuff to physicians, urologists, endocrinologists, primary care doctors to make sure that there aren't, let's say, concurrent medical issues. But even if there are psychogenic issues issues or psychological issues, let's say this individual has been in therapy for years with someone and they haven't seen progress. Well, is the therapy that the person is doing really targeting the underlying issues that are contributing to this difficulty? So if, again, before we, we say like, all right, we're, we're, we're pursuing the path of acceptance here, we also want to make sure, have we opened all the doors? Have we pursued all the avenues to, to make sure that we are addressing as holistically as possible all the different etiologies that might contribute to sexual difficulties? Yeah, and Dr. Craig, I really appreciate that you said that because the, the listeners in this podcast know, the people that I work with know, that um, I like to make sure that we have turned over every possible stone, as long as that aligns with the client's goal. Because if the client really wants to make sure they've done everything before coming to that place and making that almost transition towards you know, acceptance of a new reality and having to work within those confines, there oftentimes are a lot of areas that have not been explored. They won't always necessarily yield the results that people want, but it is multifactorial and complex, and it really is about you know trying to get to the bottom of these factors. So you did kind of steal my next question to you, which was, is there ever a point where it is too late, where it is too much? Uh, but it sounds like yes, obviously we can get to that point, you know. But a lot of times with with you know adequate exploration, it may not be like an immediate shift towards acceptance. There is a lot that can be done, can be looked at, and hopefully can help men move in the direction that they want. Absolutely. And I think the question of when is it too late, I don't think there's ever a point where it's too late to try to improve something. There may be points where you might say you can't go back to the way things were, you know, in with 100% certainty or with 100%, um, you know, alignment with what, what things were before. Because like I said, there, there are many changes that do take place over the lifespan that we don't have a great deal of control over. Even if there are changes that have taken place in someone's body as a product of age, as a product of injury, there are still ways to enhance an experience, to make something more meaningful, to make something more value congruent. So even if there are changes that have taken place, I don't think it's ever too late to improve something as long as there's commitment to the process. Just like I say to any couple that comes in, even if a couple has been struggling for decades, there's always room for things to improve if couples are willing to invest in the process and lean into the process. So I don't think it's ever too late uh, to enhance and improve a sexual experience, but it doesn't always mean that your body is going to respond precisely how it might otherwise have in the past. Again, such such great points. Dr. Gray, I feel like I could you know sit here and mind this for, for hours because so much of what you're sharing is like in line with how I think about this on, 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 you know, our website it says right across the top, empowering men to improve erections. And I think the words that you're hitting on align so much with how I think about this, which is there almost always, if not always is room for improvement. Um, but part of that is also recognizing, like you said, that like, if your goal is to get back to a baseline when you were 25, like there are certain limitations that we can't, you know, help to facilitate. We are not magicians. But if somebody's looking to improve their baseline function from where it is now to get toward a better place, that is something that oftentimes there is work that can be done, both from the physical and from the psychological point. So, Dr. Krug, like this, such a powerful message. And I want to thank you once again for joining us to talk about what men can do when they feel like nothing is progressing forward. Well, thank you so much for having me. It was really great to, to share with you.